Hi, this is Bedrest Coach Darlene Turner Lee, owner and founder of Mamas on Bedrest and Beyond. Today I'm doing like this mini book review on this fascinating book I found while doing um, a historical review of Bedrest. Um, I was writing this for uh, the Lamaze um, blog called Science and Sensibility. And in doing a bit of research, I looked at the history of bed rest. And this is what I found. Bed rest was initially prescribed as early as the 19th century. And it was first described by a neurologist named Silas Ware Mitchell, which is like a neurologist. What is that about? He was a guy who was working with um, a lot of the soldiers who were coming back from the Civil War and were having all kinds of you know, psychoses and post-traumatic stress. And at first he was prescribing bed rest. And what was found was they were getting crazier. So of course, um, shortly after that, they stopped using it because they realized, well, you know, this isn't really helping these guys. But interestingly enough, while the bed rest prescription was used for a lot of different um, disciplines like orthopedics, heart surgery, after people had spinal taps and what have you, and being eventually found ineffective it has persisted to be used for obstetrics. So I always, I thought, well, this is really wild. But um, what was really interesting to me was, and I have it down here because I took some notes, the bed rest cure was initially indicated for those suffering nervous injuries and maladies as a result of fighting in the Civil War. Later, the bed rest cure was specifically prescribed to people, primarily women, with mental disorders, particularly hysteria. Well, you know, if you look back through time, a lot of times hysteria was depression, and in particular postpartum depression. So these women were crying, they were stressed out, what have you, after having these babies, and they were told they were being hysterical, so they were prescribed bed rest. It was amazing. Um, how it happened was they were like put in these rooms. Uh, this, is, this is what it says in particular. The bed rest cure, which consisted of isolation, confinement to bed, a high fat diet and massage. So you were literally, not only were you depressed, were you having all these other feelings, maybe post-traumatic stress if you had a stressful birth, you were then confined and left alone. I mean, I just found it fascinating. But I mean, I don't know, I guess I'm a nerd. I did find it fascinating. But what really piqued my interest was there was a woman in the eighth, uh, 19th century, rather, who actually wrote a book, a sort of autobiographical book about her experience with bed rest at when she had postpartum psychosis. Now Charlotte Perkins Gilman, she was a really fascinating lady for her time. Um, born in the mid 1800s, she was a writer, she was a feminist, she was a sociologist, and she just kind of nailed it. She was also a patient of Silas Ware Mitchell's, but she wrote this book, The Yellow Wallpaper, and I'm going to try and hold it up here so you can see it. It's a little tiny thing. It's like 26 pages long. It's got really huge print. But when I saw this in my research, I had to get it. I got it on Amazon.com. But it's really interesting. It's this short little vignette about a woman and her, her husband, who is a physician, who they go out to the country for the summer for like three months, and she's basically um, ensconced in this room in this old estate house, and it has this yellow wallpaper with this funky print on it, and she just becomes obsessed with it, and she eventually goes psychotic. But it's just, it was so fascinating, because when you think, um, this was written, I had it down, in something, you know, mid-1800s, early 1900s, and she's really describing, you know, postpartum psychosis because, you know, she's seeing this woman and behind the pattern of the wallpaper and the woman's coming out at her. And interestingly, at the end of the story, she becomes the woman and is skulking around and talking all this craziness and everything else. Um, it, it's a really quirky little read, but I just thought it was so interesting because this woman, um, Charlotte Perkins Gilman, was someone who was actually recorded as having been on bed rest, having been treated by Silas Weir Mitchell, who was the you know, initial proponent of bed rest. And she really didn't have a good course. I mean, she just really had, you know, kind of the worst of the worst. But interestingly, this little book has some really great take home messages for those of us who are dealing with people on bed rest, dealing with bed rest as patients of bed rest, what have you. And I want to share them with you here, and I'm going to kind of go back and forth through the book, 
and share with you these little little tokens. Um, the first thing that I got is that, and we uh, many of us know this, but it bears repeating. Physicians don't know everything. On the first page of the book, um, the heroine, and she's never given a name in the book. She's just the heroine. She talks about how her husband, you know, is kind of guiding everything. He makes all the decisions. He tells her what to do, tells her what she can and can't do, when, how, what she should eat. And she says, John is a physician, perhaps, and I would not say it's to a living soul, of course, but this is dead paper and a great relief to my mind. Perhaps that is the reason I do not get well faster. I mean, it was hysterical. I mean, the cheekiness of this. You see, he does not believe I am sick. And what can one do? If a physician of high standing and one's own husband assures friends and relatives that there's really nothing the matter with one but temporary nervous depression, a slight hysterical tendency, what's one to do? I mean, totally discounted. We know that physicians don't know everything. We know there are high rates of postpartum depression, especially women who have high-risk pregnancies, have been on bed rest, have traumatic pregnancies and or deliveries, etc. But it bears repeating. Physicians don't know everything. If you feel like something's going on, speak with a health care provider, physician, nurse practitioner, what have you, and keep talking till you get the help you need. Um, another really interesting thing is it, when we talked about she was kind of ensconced in this room. It's, it's actually the nursery, the top floor of this um, estate house, is to do something that you love while you're on bed rest. I mean, you know, you can't sit around all the time. And I know some women say, well, it's so hard to focus, what have you. I'm not saying you have to write literature or, or anything. Find something that you like to do, whether it be knitting, crocheting, puzzles, whatever. But, you know, our heroine, again, um, she was talking, she was a writer. I mean, and this is, like they say, somewhat autobiographical. And she loved to write. Um, and they kept telling her, you know, don't do anything. So I take phosphate, whichever, phosphate, phosphites, whatever it is, and tonics and journeys and air and exercise, and I'm absolutely forbidden to work until I am well again. Personally, I disagree with their ideas. And she's right. Personally, I believe that congenial work with excitement and change would do me some good. And it's so true. When you're on bed rest, do things you like, play games, do puzzles, needlework, whatever, you know, whatever that thing is that you can bring into your bed rest environment that perks up your spirits, that keeps you happy, keeps you motivated, keeps you going, definitely do it. Um, I am a huge proponent of people not isolating on bed rest. I think you should have a steady flow of visitors if possible. People should be checking on you, helping you out, what have you. And interestingly, this poor woman was completely isolated. I'm going to come over here and read you what she says about it. Um, she's talking about her husband again. Dear John, he loves me very dearly and hates to have me sick. I have tried with real earnest, reasonable talk. I have tried to have a real earnest, reasonable talk with him the other day and tell him how I wish he would let me go and make a visit to Cousin Henry and Julia. She, she just wants company. I mean, she, this woman, you have to read the whole little story, and we're not going to do that here. She's no one visiting her except the attendant who comes in to bring her food and her husband. She was able to make no decisions for her care, um, no choices about what she ate or anything. And, and all she wanted was just to have some people come over. At one point, they say her mom came down, and oh, it was too much for her. And she's like, well, I really liked it. Very interesting. So yes, don't isolate. Have people come over. Have people visit. Um, next point. If and again, we're talking 19th century versus 21st century. So of course things are a lot different. But if you feel something is wrong or strange, definitely speak up. Definitely get help. I mean, um, our heroine here. And I'm coming over to page five. She's like that spoils my ghostly. I'm afraid. Nah, nah, nah. Um, she didn't like the house they were staying in. Um, she says, there's something strange about this house. I can feel it. Now, part of this was this lady was becoming aggressively psychotic, but she really didn't like it. At times, she didn't like the room she was in. She would say, can I stay in another room? Can I stay in one that faces a guard? No, 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 no. This is what's best for you. Um, I get unreasonably angry with John sometimes. I'm sure I never used to be so sensitive. I think it's due to this nervous condition. Partially, yes, but partially. But John says, if I feel so, I shall neglect proper self-control. 
So I take pains to control myself, before him at least, and that makes me very tired. I don't like our room one bit. I wanted one downstairs that opened onto the piazza and had roses all over the window. And such pretty old-fashioned chintz hangings, but John's would not hear of it. Uh, he said there was only one window and not room for two beds and no near room for him if he took another. He is very careful and lovely, loving and hardly lets me stir without special direction. Again, no control. I have a scheduled prescription for each hour of the day. He takes all care from me, and so I feel basically ungrateful not to value it more. And that was the thing. You know, I know what's best for you. I know how to take care of you. I know everything that you need. And we know this, this just doesn't bode well with women. We don't dig that. We want to be able to say, you know, I like this. I want that. I want the other. And thankfully, we aren't living in the 19th century where such um, choice is taken from us. But again, there are those among us who may have physicians who are really this didactic and take away our ability to make choices. So I, I say, if you feel something is strange or out of sorts, definitely, you know, speak up and, you know, make your position heard. Again, you got to partner with your health care providers. You have to be an active person. Do not be dismissed. Um, this poor woman at one point admits, you know, all I do is cry. I cry a lot. Um, I'm cry, I cry at nothing and cry most of the time. Of course, I don't, do, I don't do it when John is here or anyone else, but when I am alone, and I am alone a good deal now. I mean, it's kind of like, is she crying because she, she was alone or is she alone and now she's crying? And, and it's real crazy, but the fact that she's crying a lot, if you are a mama on bed rest and you're crying a lot, I won't say you're definitely depressed, but it's definitely something to get checked out. You know, talk with your health care provider. And it may be that you are just lonely and you need to have an attendant come in and see you. But that that's worrisome if you feel like you're crying all of the time. Um, be honest about your feelings. Again, this poor lady, she had no choice. Her husband was a physician. He had totally basically mowed her over. But um, yes, definitely be honest about your feelings. State your needs. Say when something just doesn't feel right. Say when something's not jiving with you. Say when something's not working for you so that um, changes and adjustments can be made. And finally, um, what I thought was really interesting with this book is they didn't really have the diagnosis of postpartum depression at the time. We do. And, and sadly, it's, it's not always screened for, sometimes not any better than it was in the 1800s. Um, as this lady points out, if you're crying a lot, if you are isolated, if you're not able to interact, if you're finding that, you know, at one point she says, all I do is sleep. Um, if you're sleeping a lot, you're not finding interest in things and you're not engaged with your baby. This lady, she had had a child and it was, oh, well, so-and-so, this lady, Jenny, was taking care of the child. But she wasn't even really that interested. And she said, well, Jenny's better for the baby anyway. You know, if you're finding these types of things, you know, that could be a problem. And you very well, very well may have postpartum depression if it's, be, if it's after you've delivered. And there is antinatal depression. I mean, being on bed rest, having a high-risk pregnancy, having complications, it can be depressing. If you're finding that you're crying, feeling isolated, don't want to talk to people, don't want to do anything, um, sleeping, achy, you know, all these different things that just kind of aren't the norm for you, definitely get it checked out. But I, I just thought this was an amazing little work for this little 26 page, um, it's like a little booklet. I don't even think it took me a half an hour to read. It's called The uh, Yellow Wallpaper by uh, Charlotte Perkins Gilman. And it was really an interesting portrait of a woman who was developing postpartum psychosis and nobody was catching it. I mean, just totally blew her off. Oh, you're going to be okay. You're going to be okay. And she was a dynamic woman. I mean, she was um, married to Charles Walter Stetson. She actually divorced him in the 1800s, which was almost unheard of. She divorced him. She also was a woman who was huge into the feminist movement. As you can see, she was a writer, very outspoken. And interestingly, um, she committed suicide in 1935 after being diagnosed with breast cancer. And by her own words, she said, I'd rather die of chloroform than of breast cancer. So, I mean, a fascinating lady. Just, I, I found it really interesting. 
Not that that has a whole lot of bearing on bed rest, but her case, her situation, this story, um, I thought was really pertinent and had some really great take home po points that I shared here. So I'm not saying you need to run out and buy the yellow wallpaper. You could if you'd like it. I bought it on Amazon.com. I don't think it was that much. But it was just real interesting, and I, I thought an interesting kind of take on the whole bed rest thing that we talk about, the debate whether it's useful, not useful, is it good, bad, or indifferent. This doesn't address specifically um, pregnancy bed rest, and you know the jury is still out on that. So many people are arguing for it, against it. Doctors are like, well, if we don't do that, what are we going to do? Um, but I just thought it was a really interesting take because as far as I can tell, this is the earliest documentation of bed rest that I know of. And I've looked. Now, there may be more. If somebody knows of something, please share it with me. I'd love to look at it. But as far as I can tell, this is the earliest documentation of a case of bed rest. Quite frankly, it didn't go so well. So I just found it really interesting. And I really wanted to share that with you for a different perspective. But again, I want to just run really quickly through the takeaway lessons. A, physicians don't know everything, or we'll say number one instead of A. Number one, physicians don't know everything. Two, do something you love while you're on bed rest to keep yourself busy and keep yourself cheered up. Three, don't isolate. Get people involved, get people to help you, and have people visit you often. Have a lot of company. Four, if you feel something is wrong or strange, it probably is, and you should seek help talk to your provider. Um, you know, a lot of women are like, well, I'm on bed rest, or if I'm pregnant, I don't want to be on antidepressants, what have you. You just may need to talk to somebody, and it may not be all that, but definitely get help. Number five, if you're crying a lot, this could be a sign of either antinatal depression, postpartum depression, other types of depression, but you know, uh, bed rest is frustrating, it's irritating, it's aggravating, it's stressful. But if you're crying like really all the time, you need to get some help. Number six, be a partner in your health care. Be forceful. If something's not working for you, keep talking to your provider to reach a compromise. I mean, there may be treatments that you have to have just to keep you safe and healthy, you and your baby. But other things like this poor woman hating her room, hating, you know, things that were going on, you need to speak up. Number seven, right along with that, be honest about your feelings. You know, sometimes I talk with women like, how are you? Oh, no, I'm, you know, I'm really okay. Mm, not so much. Be honest about your feelings. Speak up. And finally, if you have or had postpartum depression, you need help. This is not something that's just going to go away. You know, one of the things, and I don't know if I read this one to you, this woman's husband said to her, um, where is it? He's... Uh, he said I was his darling and his comfort and all he had and that I must take care of myself for his sake what's that got to do and keep well he says no one but myself can help me out of it that I must use my will and self-control and let and not let any silly fancies run away with me depression is not a silly fancy people it is a medical condition <laughs> um, often due to biochemical imbalances in your brain I mean this is real stuff it's, it's not like you'd say to a diabetic just don't eat sugar. I mean, the body is not able to adequately balance its uh, neurotransmitters. So this is real. And if you've had a history of postpartum depression or depression and you kind of feel symptoms or if you just feel out of sorts, again, if you're crying and irritable, this, that, and the other thing, just mention it to your health care provider. It may be nothing. It may just be the stress of bed rest. But if it is something, you really want to get treated and treated soon. So this was kind of a gas. Again, you know, the earliest um, writings on bed rest by a really cool lady. She was way ahead of her time. But um, I just wanted to share that with you as a different perspective. And even though, again, it was 1800s, had some really good take-home points for Mamas on bed rest. So I hope you enjoyed it. If you want to get it, again, it's the Yellow, pa yellow Wallpaper by Charlotte Perkins Gilman. And um, like I said, I got it on Amazon. I'm not sure where else you can get it, but, you know, you go on Amazon.com and pick it up if you'd like. It's a really quick read. You know, I'm not saying run out and buy it because there's not a whole lot of substance to it, but I just found it interesting for what I do and wanted to share that with you today. So that's it for me. I am Darlene Turner Lee, bed rest coach, owner and founder of Mamas on Bed Rest Beyond and Beyond. Ah, now maybe I'm going crazy. I can't even speak. Owner and founder of Mamas on Bed Rest and Beyond. Thanks for joining me today.